So yes, um, just to note, uh, the homework that I have been assigning will not be due Monday. It says that it's due Monday on Sakai, but I will change that to Wednesday. Um, so whatever homework you're working on right now won't be due on Monday, it'll be due on Wednesday. Also, as I'm sure you all know at this point, there will be no class on Monday and Tuesday. This is to try to help you all kind of sort out this chaos of possibly having to move out of dorms and the fact that we've been thrown into another chaotic um, semester. Obviously this entire semester should have been online. Um, yeah, any other questions that y'all have before I get started with um, the lecture? No? Everyone's clear? Um, okay. So let me do a brief review of what we discussed last time. So last time, we just started uh, 1.6. So we're kind of going to loop around. We're going to do a little bit of 1.6, then we're going to go into 1.4. And what we discussed were arguments and valid arguments. Can someone remind me what a valid argument is? Or can someone remind me what an argument is? An argument is a sequence of propositions ending in a conclusion. Yes, thank you very much. An argument is a sequence of propositions and a conclusion. And the, the argument is valid. So the argument is valid. Uh, argument is valid if the truth of the premises forces the truth of the conclusion, right? And as we discussed uh, last time, uh, valid arguments come from tautologies. And not just any tautology, valid arguments come from a special kind of tautology. Um, for instance, uh, there is the basic um, valid argument form called modus ponens. And this is the valid argument form. Can someone remind me what the premises for modus ponens are if we're dealing with variables P and Q? That P implies Q. Uh, right, we take P and then we also take P implies Q. Two statements, these are the two premises. And the conclusion is therefore Q. This is an argument at the very least because it's built up of several propositions, namely the premises, and then a conclusion. And then one can ask, is this a valid argument? Or if all the uh, premises are true, namely P is true and P implies Q is true, is it possible for Q to be false? And the answer is no. If P is true and P implies Q is true, then Q must be true. You could sort that out uh, using a truth table, or you could check that the proposition um, P and P implies Q all together implies Q 
is a tautology. So here what I did is if I want to go from an argument that is written in this way to a tautology or to what should be a tautology if it's a valid argument form, is I just do the conjunction of all of the premises. So I've done P conjunction, P implies Q, and then I imply the conclusion and then I check to see if this is a tautology. And the good way to check if this is a tautology is to um, use the substitution method. Would people like for me to do the substitution method on this to check that it's actually a tautology? Yeah, why don't I do it? So let's check. So um, if we have P and P implies Q, implies Q, what's a good first substitution to make? The implication substitution for? Yeah, I agree. There are two implications involved. My tendency is to try to simplify the ones further on the inside first, right? If I try to simplify this one first, then I'd have to negate a statement involving an implication. And while that's possible, it's easier for me to negate the stuff on the, or not to negate, but to simplify the stuff on the inside. So by implication substitution, I get what? P and? Not P or Q. Yep, not P or Q implies Q. Let me put parentheses around this. What can I do with this statement on the inside of the parentheses? I have a P and, and then I have a compound proposition involving an or. So I don't quite see absorption yet. Here at the moment I see a distribution. I want to distribute the P and to the not P and to the Q. So distribution. And once again, I want to remind y'all that there are oftentimes many, many ways that you can proceed. So uh, just because I choose to do these steps in a particular order doesn't mean that that's the only correct way or that you, know, you can't find a better way. So here, this will be equivalent to P and not P or P and, uh, P and Q. I put all this in parentheses implies Q. Do we agree with this step of distributing the P and through this compound proposition? It's like, uh, like actual distribution. Any questions here? Okay, is there something that I can do for P and not P? Yeah, this is the negation law, which says P and not P is always false, exactly. So I have a false or P and Q implies Q. I can simplify this further. What is a false or proposition? Is it just a proposition? Yeah, I'll end up just having the original proposition, right? A false, so if I have an or, it says check if either one of these are true or false, but the false is always false. So this entire proposition will be true exactly when P and Q is true. Does anyone remember what this is called? Identity, this is the identity law. Okay, now that I've got a kind of simplified statement, 
I can try to get rid of this uh, implication using once again an implication substitution. So I get the negation of P and Q or Q. What do I do next? De Morgan's, yes, very good. De Morgan's allows me to distribute negations through compound propositions. So this is uh, equivalent to not P. I flip the um, and to an or, not Q. All this in parentheses, or Q. What can I do next? So commutativity in this scenario would either switch not P and not Q, or it would switch Q and this whole proposition. But I think what I want is associativity because I want to get the parentheses around this not Q or Q. Yeah, so associativity in this case, I think. So associativity, is there a question? not Q or Q. And then what can I do with a not Q or Q? Uh, once again, this will be a negation or yeah, a not Q or Q will just give me a true. So I get a not P or true. And what happens when I do an or with a true? So this will be domination, right? This is always just true. So using this sequence of steps, using these transformations from uh, this proposition, I get to I get the fact that this proposition is a tautology because I was able able to use substitution to use substitutions while wow, until I got something true. So what this tells you is that if p is true and p implies q is true, q must be true. So this is a valid form of argument, namely modus ponens. Any questions on this? Okay, well, if there are no more questions, now what we're going to see is essentially a, another list of valid uh, argument forms. So list of valid argument forms. So we already did uh, modus ponens. Um, we also discussed modus tollens last time, which is um, not Q, P implies Q, therefore not P. Can someone kind of construct the uh, the tautology that this argument form comes from? Not Q and P implies Q. Not Q and P implies Q mm -hmm. imply not P is the full statement. So all of the uh, all of the argument forms come from tautologies, which are conjunctions of all of the premises imply the conclusion, and then you check whether this whole thing is a tautology. This whole thing will be a tautology for the exact same reason that the previous one was a tautology. Because notice, this is there an equivalent substitution that we can make for p implies q. 
in this case, I don't want to do the usual substitution that we do. I want to do the contrapositive. What's the contrapositive of P implies Q? Not Q implies not P. Yeah, thank you very much. Not Q implies not P implies not P. And this is in the exact same form as modus ponens, right? Not Q and not Q implies not P implies not P. This is a tautology. Okay, let's do more. Uh, there's the hypothetical syllogism. Such wonderful words we get in this class. Hypothetical syllogism, which says uh, P implies Q and Q implies R, therefore P implies R. And here the tautology uh, involved with this valid argument form is of course, sorry, P implies Q and Q implies R implies P implies R. And if you wanted to check that this is a valid argument form, you could check that this uh, syllogism, so that's S-Y-L-L-O-G-I-S-M, syllogism, sorry. It's Greek, I think. So, right, if you wanted to check that this was a valid argument form, you could go through the work of checking that this whole statement is a tautology, which it is. And this just says, if you know the following two things, that statement, statement P implies statement Q, and moreover, statement Q implies statement R, then you can conclude that statement P implies statement R is a true statement. Okay, um, we have the disjunctive syllogism. Uh, which is, if the proposition, we have the propositions P or Q, and then not P, what should we be able to conclude from this, this pair of statements? There, that is, we're saying either P or Q is true and P is false, therefore, Q must be true. And Q being true is equivalent to just writing Q. Because remember, these arguments are saying, if all of these propositions are true, then this proposition is true, right? And the uh, tautology that this one comes from is P or Q and not P implies Q. This one's a pretty easy one to see that it's a tautology, right? You would just you distribute uh, the not P through the P or Q, you'd get uh, P and not P, so you get a false, or Q and not P implies Q. I mean, this one, this one's faster than some of these other ones to check that this is a tautology. Um, we have some even faster ones. So there's the additive argument form. So this is P, therefore, P or Q. So this comes from the tautology, P implies P or Q. This one's extremely quick to see that this is a tautology. Can someone walk me through the first step? What should I do when I have an implication, usually? I should do, yes, thank you, uh, Yutong. I should do the implication substitution. So 
implication substitution, which is not P or P or Q. Here I can do associativity, right? Instead of having the parentheses around P or Q, since everything involved is an or, I can switch the parentheses to not P or P or Q by associativity. What's not P or P? True, exactly. This is true or Q by negation. And what's Q or true? Yeah, it's just true by the domination law. So we see that this proposition, P implies P or Q, is a tautology. And this is, I mean, this argument form is just saying, if you know a statement is true, you can take any other statement and say or, right? Peaches have pits or the sky is green. So if peaches have pits is true, which it is, then the statement peaches have pits or the sky is green is a true statement. Okay, uh, simplification. This is the statement that if you have the proposition P and Q is true, then you can conclude the statement P. Right? This seems also fairly natural. If, if an and statement is true, that means each of the individual statements is true. So we can conclude that one of the individual statements is true. So this is just going to be um, coming from the tautology P and Q implying P. And this is an easy tautology as well. You're just gonna do the simplification substitution and then do De Morgan's. How do I spell that? Simplification, um, S-I, I should be more careful when I write, S-I-M-P-L-I-F-I-C-A-T-I-O-N. Although honestly, if y'all keep asking me how I spell things, I'm gonna make mistakes. I haven't like spelled things correctly in a long time. So everyone has to be very careful and double check all my spelling. Um, we're almost done. Uh, conjunction. Uh, if we have the proposition P, so P is true and also Q is true, I can conclude that P and Q is true. This is kind of the reverse of simplification. Here, if the and or the conjunction of two statements is true, then each of the statements is true individually. On the other hand, if two statements are true, then their conjunction is also true. This is just essentially coming from truth table stuff. So this is P and Q implies P and Q. Well, this is definitely gonna be true. This is definitely gonna be a tautology because whenever this statement is true, this statement is definitely gonna be true. And whenever this statement is false, an implication with a false premise is always true, so. This is definitely a tautology, right? P implies P is always true, regardless of whether P is true or false. Because P implies P is the same as not P or P. And the last one, this one's a little more challenging, uh, resolution, which is uh, P or Q and not P or R, from this we can conclude Q or R. And this comes from the tautology, um, P or Q and not P or R implies Q or R. Okay. So once again, I've given y'all a big long list of um, now in this case, not ways of uh, 
changing a proposition while preserving the truth value, what I've instead done is given you a long list of argument forms where if you know the truth of some of the propositions, you can get the truth of the conclusion. So this is how we start thinking about proofs. Proofs are going to be um, essentially chains of valid arguments strung together. Any questions on this? No questions. It's a gray Friday, huh? Everyone's kind of tired. Everyone is trying to figure out what's going on in their life right now. I get it. OK. Um, what I want to do next is I want to show you how we string together valid arguments to make a more complicated um, make a more complicated argument. So um, string valid arguments together. So here I'm going to just do an example that's coming straight from the book. So let's get a bunch of propositions together. The next one that I'll do will be not directly from the book or from the homework, not from the examples. Um, it is sunny this afternoon, or it is not sunny this afternoon. And it is colder than yesterday. So here's one proposition. Here's another proposition. Um, we will go swimming only if it is sunny. I think I am doing this example because I didn't get to swim at all this summer, which is garbage. Um, if we take a, okay, yes, if we do not go swimming, we will take a canoe trip. Um, if we take a canoe trip, uh, we will be home by sunset. We will be home by sunset. So here are a bunch of premises. And then I want to ask, can we conclude that we will be home by sunset, that we will be home by sunset? Wow, I can no longer speak. Can we conclude that we will be home by sunset? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform this collection of statements into symbols, and then we're going to produce an argument, and then we need to check that the argument is valid. Okay? Any questions on this right now, what I'm doing? Maybe it's more helpful if I do it a little bit first, and then you ask questions, but still. No? Okay. So um, I'm going to take the proposition, it is sunny this afternoon, as P. And it is colder than yesterday, as um, Y, how about? So how would I, if I take this as P and this as Y, how would I write the first uh, statement in symbols? You just Q and I. Y. Exactly. Not P and Y. Cool. Okay. Um, 
this next proposition is we will go swimming. So we will go swimming, I'll call this S, only if it is sunny this afternoon. So sunny this afternoon. So here, being sunny this afternoon is already called P. So what is this proposition translated into logic? Is it a biconditional S? Well, I don't think it's a biconditional. The biconditional is if and only if, but here we only have the only if part. So we will go swimming only if it is sunny this afternoon. It's still possible that it could be sunny and you don't go swimming, right? The only thing that's not possible is for uh, you to go swimming and it to not be sunny. So this is S implies P, not P implies S, right? It's not the case that if it is sunny, we will go swimming. Right? It could be sunny and we could still go canoeing. This statement is just saying uh, it being sunny is a prerequisite to going swimming. So S implies P. If we went swimming, it has to be sunny. Are we okay how we translated this sentence into this implication? It's not possible for us to go swimming and for it to not be sunny. That's the only case where this proposition is false. Any questions about why this is S implies P and not P implies S? Okay, y'all are awful quiet, but I will continue. So if we don't go swimming, well, this is already, so this is not S, right? We will take a canoe trip. The canoe trip I will um, label by C. So what should this next proposition be? If blank, then blank. Not S implies C. Yep, not S implies C. And then this last proposition is, if we take a canoe trip, we'll be home by sunset. So I'll call home by sunset H. What would this uh, last one be? If we take a canoe trip, then we will be home by sunset. C implies H. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I'm not used to reading the comments. Uh, so C implies H. And then now I'm asking, does this collection of premises imply H, right? Can we conclude that we'll be home by sunset? So what I want to do, and here's, here's the strategy to kind of analyze these more complicated arguments, is I'm going to give each of these a number. So I'm gonna say not P and Y is gonna be proposition one. Uh, S implies P is gonna be proposition two. Not S implies C is gonna be proposition three. And C implies H is gonna be proposition four. Okay. Now what I want to do is if I want to conclude H, I, I can either kind of work forwards or work backwards. Um, maybe what I'll do now is the kind of working forwards way. What can I do with not P and Y? What's a valid argument that takes not P and Y? I can simplify this, right? If not P is true and Y is true, then not P is true all by itself and Y is true all by itself. Do you agree? 
What valid argument form is that? This is simplification of statement one, or I'll just write simplification one. I'm gonna produce from not P and Y the statement not P. So I get a new proposition from this old collection of propositions by applying a valid argument form to this proposition. Okay, if I have not P and S implies P, is there a valid argument form that combines these two propositions and produces a conclusion? Dissociative syllogism, I think in this case, what I want to use is modus tollens um, because I've got an implies. If this were an or, then I would use dissociative syllogism, yes. But here I can use modus tollens, I'll just abbreviate it MT, and then I'll tell you which propositions I'm using, two and five. So I'm using modus tollens on statements two and five, and what conclusion do I get from modus tollens? not P and S implies P, therefore, not S, not S, exactly, not S. This is the argument modus tollens, not P and S implies P implies not S. Okay, now I have statements not S and not S implies C. What can I use here? Here I can use modus ponens. Modus ponens on statements six and statements three, not S and not S implies C together imply what? C, exactly. I get the statement C. And now to conclude, statement C and statement C implies H, what can I use to combine these two? Modus ponens again. Again, modus ponens using statements seven and four, and I get therefore H. So in words, here's the argument. It is not sunny this afternoon and it is colder than yesterday. Notice that Y doesn't matter. Y is like a false herring. We don't use it in the argument at all. Next statement is, uh, we will go swimming only if it is sunny this afternoon. Then we have, if we don't go swimming, we will take a new canoe trip. If we take a canoe trip, we'll be home by sunset. This statement is, since it is not sunny and it is colder than yesterday, it is not sunny this afternoon. Now, using the statement, it is not sunny this afternoon and we will go swimming only if it is sunny this afternoon implies we will not go swimming this afternoon. Then the statement, we will not go swimming and if we don't go swimming, we will take a canoe trip means we will take a canoe trip this afternoon. And then lastly, since we will take a canoe trip and if we take a canoe trip, we will be home by sunset, therefore we will be home by sunset. So here what I used is I used a combination of valid argument forms to show that this argument form is valid. Any question here?
Hmm. Even a no would make me happy. Um, okay, let's do another example. Let's examine, this is going to not be exactly something on your homework, but it's going to be close to something on your homework. Um, let's find out if the following argument is a valid argument form. P and T implies R or S. We'll call this proposition one. Uh, Q implies u and t is proposition two. u, sorry, u implies p, it's gonna be proposition three. Not s will be proposition four, and q will be proposition five. And I want to see if I can conclude r from this thing. In other words, is this a valid argument? where I take the following premises, P and T imply R or S, Q implies U and T, U implies P, not S, Q. From these premises, can I conclude R? And once again, my way of proceeding will be by using a combination of valid argument techniques or valid arguments. So I'm just gonna relist P and T implies R or S. Q implies U and T. U implies P, not S. Here's Q. Okay. Here I need to kind of think that I want to work backwards. I want R, and the only place where R appears is here, R or S. So I need to get this statement R or S because otherwise there's no way for me to get the statement just R. But in order to get R or S, I need to get the proposition P and T because if P and T is true and P and T implies R or S, then we'll get R or S. So I need P and T. Well, what do I need to get P and T? Probably that means I need to get P by itself and I need to get T by itself. I can get P from U and I can get T from Q. Okay, well, the place to start seems to be the modus ponens here, right? So my first step will be modus ponens on five and two. What can I conclude from modus ponens on the statement five and the statement two? Q and Q implies U and T. Therefore, I conclude U and T. U and T by modus ponens. Well, I don't just want U and T, right? I kind of want them to be separate because here I use U and here I use T. So, what can I do? I can simplify. So simplification of six will get me u, and a second simplification of six will get me t. Okay? So just by starting with these initial five statements, I can already conclude that u is true and t is true. Okay? Well, if U is true, is there anything I could combine U with? Or is there any other statement involving U that I could use to get a new proposition being true? Yes, exactly. I can use modus ponens on statements seven and three to conclude what? 
that P must be true. Exactly. I have U and I have U implies P, therefore P. Okay. Well, now I have P and separately I have T. And I know that I want P and T because that appears as one of my uh, propositions. So now, is there a way for me to get the statement P and T? Use conjunction. Yep, I want to use conjunction on propositions eight and nine to get P and T. Are we okay with that? Excellent, thank you. Um, what can we do using P and T? Is there, is there a modus ponens somewhere? Yep, modus ponens of 10 and one will yield what? P and T and P and T implies R or S will give me R or S. Okay, I want R, I have R or S, so the only way to get only R is if I had a not S floating around, right? But I do. I can use now disjunctive syllogism. Disjunctive syllogism. If R or S is true and S is not true, then R must be true. This is disjunctive syllogism on four and 11. Okay, this is a more complicated example, but this shows you how you can analyze complicated arguments by breaking up the complicated argument into a collection of more simple arguments. And what we showed here is that this argument form is valid. This is a valid argument form. Okay, so here we're, just to summarize, since we're almost out of time, we started off this class by saying we need to introduce um, propositions and we need to be able to assess whether they're true or false. But at the end of the day, we're not just trying to assess whether propositions are true or false, or we are, but a powerful way of doing that is to use arguments. You want to be able to say, you know, things like modus ponens. If P is true and P implies Q is true, then Q is true. This is the way that we want to argue things in math. Um, and this is the way that proofs go. So we built up our arguments by saying a valid argument is a collection of propositions and a conclusion such that if all the propositions are true, the conclusion is forced to be true. So this, this is our kind of first step towards what a mathematical proof would look like. And at the beginning, it can be a little confusing about, you know, we've, we've already come up with two big lists. One list of a bunch of substitutions you can make that'll preserve the logical equivalence of propositions. And then we've got another list of valid arguments which come from tautologies of a certain form. So at this point, there's kind of a lot of names floating around and it feels very formal. But as we work more and more with these, I think they'll become pretty comfortable. Any questions? Great, well, it is 1010, so I will talk to y'all on Wednesday. Your homework will be due on Wednesday. Um, I hope everyone stays safe this weekend. I hope the people who are moving home can move home safely. 
um, be careful. Um, the next thing that you should read if you're done reading 1.6, or at least the first chunk of 1.6, is to read 1.4. 1 1.4 and 1.5 are the next thing that we're going to do. Yep. All right. Have a wonderful morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Take care of yourselves. All right. So long.